Today was day two and the final day in the latest Julian Assange court battle. Assange's legal team is asking the United Kingdom High Court for the right to appeal two different decisions. First, the UK's sign-off on extraditing Assange to the United States. Obviously, they don't want him extradited. That's the entire point. But secondly, they're appealing a lower UK court's January 2021 decision not to extradite him solely on the basis of his mental health. So the lower court ruled against his team on every other measure to halt uh, his extradition, like abuse of human rights, political persecution, going after journalists and free speech. That judge ultimately declared that Julian was not a journalist and was only blocking his extradition because he could maybe commit suicide. So Julian's team is wanting to appeal this decision and instead... If they're given the right to appeal, then ideally Julian is granted a ruling in the future that halts any extradition based on the fact it would be politically motivated persecution of a journalist who exposed U.S. war crimes. So um, this is a two-day court hearing where Julian's team is asking for the right to appeal. It's an appeal to appeal, basically. Yesterday, Julian's team made their case. One hurdle they had to get over was this question— if this is political persecution, why did it take so long for the U.S. to finally go after him? And why did it happen under two different administrations from two different political parties? So the idea being that this can't be political if it's not just one side doing it. Now, of course, both Democrats and Republicans are warmongers equally bought off by the military industrial complex. And the one thing they can always agree on seems to be war, war, and more war. Sort of silly to think that Julian's only being sought after because he published Hillary's emails. He did much more than that to piss off both sides. He exposed war crimes committed under Bush and Obama. He exposed CIA spying techniques while Trump was in office. He basically upset everyone in the U.S. power establishment. But Julian's lawyers had to make that case. They used a few examples— First, they cited the fact that Julian was only being targeted after the International Criminal Court started finally looking into U.S. war crimes that were exposed by WikiLeaks publishing the documents. That pressure made the U.S. angry, and so Assange's team argues it's one reason why the U.S. finally asked for his extradition after a period of many years. They also brought up the leak of Vault 7 in March of 2017, just shortly after Trump took office. So this was a trove of CIA documents detailing the CIA's electronic surveillance and cyber warfare capabilities. The files included details on the CIA's ability to compromise cars, smart TVs, web browsers like Google Chrome, Edge, and Firefox, the operating systems of most smartphones, including Apple and Androids, and operating systems including Microsoft, Windows, macOS, and Linux. It was the largest data breach in CIA history, and it happened while Mike Pompeo was the director of the CIA and while Trump was president. So this led the CIA to label WikiLeaks as a non-state as a non-state hostile intelligence service. That's the actual title they gave them. Non-state, so not affiliated with any country, non-state hostile intelligence service, a label that could be slapped on any news organization exposing any government's crimes. One year later, in March of 2018, Julian Assange was indicted, but not before the CIA and senior Trump officials tried to figure out how to kidnap or kill Assange. So it's important to note uh, that the government got their leakers in both of those document dumps. They got Chelsea Manning for the 2010 dump and recently Joshua Schulte for the Vault 7 dump. So they know who leaked the documents. So why are they going after the guy who published them? What does this mean for the future pub? for future publishers and news organizations that want to publish their documents showing crimes committed by our government or really any government. Free people are only as free as the free press. Now, ironically, we all know Western governments are happy to help and support those who leak the terrible things being covered up by enemy governments. But when it happens to them, let the political persecution begin. So today, the U.S. legal team had to make their case as to why Julian Assange must be extradited and why he's not being politically persecuted. And this is what they said. They said he's a spy, not a journalist. But remember, he's not a state-sponsored spy. He's not a spy for Australia nor for any other country. He's just a spy for spy's sake. They said he put innocent lives at risk by releasing hundreds of thousands of classified documents uh, when the judges asked if these so-called innocents participated or facilitated in torture and other war crimes. According to journalist Richard Medhurst, who is on the ground reporting from London, 
The U.S. attorneys had to explain to them that, yes, that is exactly what these people were engaged in and supporting. The U.S. legal team also argued that Julian Assange could not be treated as akin to an ordinary journalist or WikiLeaks akin to an ordinary publisher because, of course, according to them, WikiLeaks is a non-state hostile intelligence service, and the only legitimate journalists and publishers in their minds are the ones they can control and who are friendly to the establishment. That much has been made clear in a number of examples. So we've seen how the establishment censors journalists on social media, labels journalists as conspiracy theorists, or even views journalists as terrorist supporters if they don't like what they're publishing. So if Julian Assange loses this battle, it will be the final death nail to a free press that's already suffocating in the coffin. The U.S. lawyers also said that Julian Assange is not being politically persecuted for his political opinions, but instead for crimes he committed. So apparently you can have the opinion that the U.S. is run by a bunch of war criminals, but if you publish the papers proving it, that's the crime. They also said he committed a crime by protecting Chelsea Manning's identity. That's just called journalists protecting their sources. They also tried to convince the judges of a loophole they think exists that allows for the U.S. to extradite someone for political offenses. So Western democratic nations have rules against extradition of those being politically persecuted, but it appears... They only want to use it when it benefits them. Now, one very frightening moment that happened during the hearing, a judge asked if Julian Assange were to be extradited, is there anything to prevent the U.S. from amending the charges to ones that carry the death penalty? And the government attorney said, the answer is no. The judge then asked if there's anything that can be done to prevent a death penalty being imposed, and the government lawyer said, it would be very difficult to offer assurances to prevent the death penalty from being imposed, but that still doesn't mean the Secretary of State was wrong in refusing to prevent extradition. So Julian was again uh, not in court today. His lawyers uh, citing ill health, and in the end, the judges said that they need time to deliberate and will come back with the decision at a later time. A number of great journalists are in London trying to cover the case, but they report some strange things going on in the courtroom, almost as if the powers that be are trying to stifle any news of this case from getting out. First, the room they chose to have the hearing in is one of the smallest in the building, which means it can't accommodate many journalists in the room. Secondly, the microphones and speakers are piss poor, so the journalists who are there can barely hear anything. Uh, Stefania, Stefania Marazzi, an Italian investigative journalist, tweeted, I sit in the courtroom three meters away from the U.S. lawyers, but we journos can't hear except a few words. Do I risk being expelled from court considering video link access is required to sit in a private space? Um, she then asked about the sound to the people in the courtroom and they responded, quote, there's nothing that can be done about the sound. And then she goes on to say, Dear readers, I have been a journalist for the last 23 years, and I have never experienced such unfair conditions for the press in any case I have followed in the Western world. So what does that tell you? They don't want you to sit there and find They don't want the journalists there. They don't want us to know what's really going on. They don't want us to know about the political persecution of journalism that they accuse other foreign nations of doing right. They're quick to point. China does. Russia does this. Russia. Look what Russia does. Oh, uh, don't look this way. Don't look this way. In fact, let's go ahead and close off the courtroom, make sure that everything's all the sound and everything is basically uh, you can't hear it. And just make sure that nobody gets this word out. Mohammed Almazi, editor in chief at Truth Defense and the Interrogonum, tweeted, quote, day two of Julian Assange's permission to appeal hearing at the High Court of Justice. I have been forced to leave the courtroom to the press office and observe via video link. God willing, the connection will be strong enough to hear everything, despite the fact that I have a press ticket that I applied early, that I am the only journalist to have covered every single hearing in Julian's extradition case since April of 2019. I was asked to leave the press section and move to the public gallery, which has no tables or anywhere for me to place my laptop and type. This is because priority is given not to the press who arrive on time, but rather members of the establishment press to ensure they have a seat even though plenty legacy and establishment press entered yesterday, having been given priority among the press, the fact that I have a disability and can't write and therefore require the use of my laptop makes it all the worse. So they're just uh, making it very difficult for the press to cover this case. Uh, Chris Hedges has also been there in London covering the court battle. 
He is uh, here. He is speaking outside where there are a number of protesters. Justice will come for Julian Assange, but it will not come from within those courts. It will come with you. It will come with us in these streets. They know how corrupt this process is. They understand fully the judicial pantomime that they have engaged in from the inception to crucify the most courageous, most important journalists of our generation, and they are hoping they will not be called out. They are hoping that we will not react. They were hoping that we will not speak out. It is the pressure that you exert on these mandarins of injustice that will free Julian. And I want to thank everyone for coming today because it is this force in this street and streets throughout the world that will finally bring Julian home. Thank you. I actually want to show you uh, some of the protests that have been going on out there. Let me go ahead and... Um See if I can show this to you. Oh, no, I cannot. Okay, that's fine. I, I had some imagery of the protest, but then I didn't load it in the system. So, But there's been a lot of protesters outside of the London courtroom. Definitely could be a lot more, uh, but there's a good number of people that are out there protesting during this entire time. Chris Hedges was out there. There's a number of speakers going on. WikiLeaks has been actually live streaming from outside of the courtroom, which is really nice to watch. If you have nine hours to spare, uh, they've been live streaming the entire time. Uh, but here is another uh, speaker. This is actually Amnesty International's attorney, Simon Cowther, and he is explaining why the charges against Assange are clearly political. Here outside the High Court in London, where the Julian Assange case is in its second day, the US today are arguing, firstly, that this isn't a political case, and even if it were, he could still be extradited to the US. This is clearly a really problematic stream of, evidence, of argument. Firstly, because this case is so clearly political. Julian Assange is being brought to court, being extradited to the US, because he disclosed or facilitated the disclosure of classified material that reveals war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, serious accusations of torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. The second argument is that this procedure does not violate freedom of expression and the US is saying that this is an irrelevance because he's not a publisher, he's not a journalist and that's clearly not the case because WikiLeaks are doing something that journalists and publishers do all the time which is receive classified material in the public interest and publish it. Get outside the high court. So uh, the, 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 making the case that this is a political persecution and in which case the UK should block any sort of um, extradition of Julian Assange for those reasons, even though the U.S. lawyers were trying to say, yeah, but you can still extradite political people. We've got a loophole here that, you know, they're trying to point out a loophole and hoping that that'll stick. So we'll see. Here's uh, some of the the protests that are going on outside. You could see these. We got the footage now. Here's the, the, the protests. Good sized crowd out there. You know, definitely would love to see larger protests the size that we've seen for uh, Palestine or for George Floyd or for any, you know, COVID mandates, any of that. I mean, this is just such an important case. But I think the majority of people don't realize how important it is to them personally. Us, Those of us who do the news, who do journalism, we know how important this case is, that if they're able to shut down Julian Assange, they're basically going to prevent anyone from publishing documents that are that are received by somebody like a Chelsea Manning uh, or in Edward Snowden. They want to shut that down. And this is the way to do that, to to instill fear in journalism, to ensure that they just go along with the establishment. They want journalists like the New York Times, who were who did the, the dirty dog work for the government and hunted down Jack Teixeira, the kid who released the latest batch of, of classified documents. That's what they're wanting the news media to be. They're wanting the news media to be their watchdogs, to be their henchmen, to go out there and find these people and help them with their persecutions, people who are exposing government crimes. They don't want the journalists, they don't want the news business to be on the side of the people, to be on the side of freedom, to be on the side of the truth more than anything and everything. They don't want that. They don't want us to be on the side of the truth. No, they want us to be on their side. That is why this case is so incredibly important. They already nabbed the people. 
who leaked the documents. They already have punished them, sentenced them to prison time. Now they're going after the publisher and they're saying, well, but he's complicit. How exactly? Well, he maybe hacked or there's no evidence of that. Or, okay, fine. Then he aided and abetted in this uh, crime of leaking these documents by encouraging Chelsea Manning to give him the documents, encouraging the illegal behavior. That's a crime. That is what they're trying to pin on Julian Assange. And it will it will harm not just journalism. It'll harm not just the news business. It hurts every single person because you cannot be a free people without a free press. We must have the ability to tell the truth. The truth is the only thing that sets us free. That isn't just a cheesy cliche. It actually has meaning. It's truth. The truth will set us free. And here's the government, Western democratic free nation governments trying to shut down the free press. So the court case is done. The two days are done. Uh, Assange's team has made their plea. And the uh, you know, Assange's team has made his plea. The U.S. government's made their plea. The U.K. government defended themselves in their decision to sign the extradition order. And so now we wait because the judges have said that they're going to take some time to deliberate and they'll come back with a, a decision. So we'll wait and find out. It could be days. It could be weeks. It could be longer. Not really sure. If his request to appeal is denied, his legal team says that they will take the case to the European Court of Human Rights, which the UK is subject to. So this fight will not be over. Of course, if his legal team prevails, then that means that they've earned the right to then appeal. And then that'll be a whole nother process. So this is not close to ending. Not anytime soon for Julian Assange. He was still too ill to attend today. He did not go to the hearings. Uh, he could end up you know, dying in prison, dying in there. And he's already been locked up for so many years. Uh, he's 52 years old now, I believe. He's been locked up since he's uh, 40 years old or even 39 or something. And it's just absolutely despicable. Free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange.